Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, take two, bad connection, I apologize for that, of course, as always, anytime I'm on, the enemy always tries to do whatever he can to uh, get into the uh, fiber optics and the satellites and all that to try to stop or hinder my broadcast, because he does not want you to hear what I am going to say through the spirit of truth today. All right, so thanks again for tuning in. I am glad that you are here. I pray that you all have had a great week. I pray that you all have had a victorious week, that you are resting, all right, because I know the week can be a little uh, uh, tumultuous sometimes, and it can be uh, very busy. We don't get to get a lot of rest, but thank God for Shalom. I pray the peace of God upon your life right now in Yeshua's name. So let's get to this lesson today. All right, because truly the Lord has a word. He has a word. All right. So we're going to be talking about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of Yahweh is within you. And the text we're going to be uh, coming from today is Matthew chapter 17. Of course, there are several other scriptures that we're going to be navigating through so that the word of the Lord will be made clear and plain. And uh, every heart will understand, every eye will see, every ear will hear what the Spirit is saying to the church right now. All right. So... <clears throat> We are in a passage where Yeshua the Messiah is actually uh, taking three of his disciples, all right, his inner circle, Kepha, Jacob, and Yohanan, Peter, James, and John. He's taking them away and apart from everything and everyone else up into a high mountain because there is something that he needed them to see. There is something that he wanted to reveal to those three sent ones. And the Bible reads in Matthew 17, verse 1 through 5. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and beheld a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. So I have just read Matthew 17 verses 1 through 8. Okay. Uh, what did the Lord want them to see? What happened there? Yeshua the Messiah was transfigured before the inner circle. And he told them, he said, listen, I don't want you to tell anybody else. Don't even tell the other disciples what you've seen until I am raised from the dead. Why was this important? What happened? What was the purpose of the Messiah showing Peter, James, and John his glorified state? And what was the purpose for the conversation between the Messiah, Moses, and Elijah. What was taking place? Let me submit to you that the Messiah was giving them a glimpse of what was past, present, and future as it pertains to the kingdom. You see, the word of God as we know it is comprised of the old covenant, and the new covenant, the law and the prophets. Moses, he appeared with Jesus 
on the mountain, and so did Elijah the prophet, who also appeared. And they were communicating. They were conversating. They were talking. About what? We don't know. But what we do know and what we can surmise is this. The Messiah is the personification, the manifestation, the theophany of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. The old covenant and the new covenant. You see, Yeshua told the disciples and he told all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He says, I did not come to destroy, to do away with, to abolish, to cast aside, to ignore, to neglect, to kill the law and the prophets. But I came that they all might be fulfilled. Yeshua is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is the embodiment of of the law and the prophets. And he needed the, the disciples that he brought up there with him to understand that you cannot do away with the law and the prophets. Yes, the Messiah says, uh, yeah, th there are 10 commandments and, and as a whole in the Torah, there are 613 commandments, but there are two commandments that I will give you now on which hangs the whole law. And that is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul and thy strength. And then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When you've done these two, you've kept the whole law. But listen, churchianity has taught you if you just do those two, you don't have to recognize or acknowledge the Torah or the law. That is a lie from the pit of Gehenna and Sheol. What you need to know is the Messiah was trying to convey to his disciples that were there with him, that you need the law and the prophets, but more importantly, you need to understand that I am the embodiment, the personification, the theophany. I am the law and the prophets fulfilled. So when I speak to you, I speak to you not of my own, but I speak the words that the Lord, my God, my Father gives me through the law and the prophets. And if you read the teachings of Yahshua the Messiah, you will discover that everything that he ever taught, everything that he ever uh, explained or proclaimed to his disciples, to the people in uh, Judea, Samaria, the, to the people uh, in the temple, the leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, everything that came out of his mouth was a reflection, a direct reflection, a mirror of what was written and penned in the law and the prophets. He did not deviate from Moses and Elijah. He is the culmination of Moses and Elijah. And he needed for the disciples to see that on the mountain of transfiguration by showing them who he really was and is. Because you can't have one without the other. For those of us who don't read the Old Testament and all we do is read the New Testament and we focus on Paul's teachings and mostly Paul's teachings alone, we're missing we're missing out. We're missing what the Lord has taught us. Yeshua was showing them that this is past, present, and future kingdom. I am the culmination of the law and the prophets. I am the living Torah. And then when Peter spoke up and said, Lord... I'm glad we're here. It is good for us to be here right now. I'm glad you chose us. Now, Lord, with your permission, please allow us to build a tabernacle. Allow us to build a temple. Allow us to build a booth. Allow us to build a ministry. Allow us to build a church. One for you, a church 
for Moses and the church in the name of the prophet Elijah. They instantly, after beholding the Shekinah of Yeshua the Messiah, after beholding his kabod, after beholding the Messiah in his true form, the very first thought in their mind after experiencing the glory was to build a church. Messiah didn't allow it. Because that's, that wasn't the point. That was not the purpose for him manifesting his glory. Why is it the Lord saying to you? When you see the glory, when you experience the glory of God. You want to memorialize it. That's not the way of Messiah. Anytime you're in the house of God and the move of God shows up and you see the glory of God and the wonders of the Lord and you see God's move. You want to memorialize it. You want to can it. You want to bottle it up and try to reproduce it in another service or another church. You're building memorials to God's glory when that is not the purpose for the manifestation of the glory. Are we understanding? Okay. Well, uh, let's talk about the church. Let's talk about temples. Okay? Because the only people that are going to be frustrated, the only people that are going to get hot the only people that are going to get their feathers ruffled or be offended or feel some type of way are those who are religious and those who are bound by religious culture. Those who are captivated and held captive by churchianity. All right. You want to talk about the kingdom? This is what we're talking about today. All right. Listen. Listen. I'm not coming to you with my own words or my own opinions because I have no opinion. I'm coming to you with the word of God. And I need for you to understand that Israel has a history of trying to build altars whenever God shows up. Look at, look at, look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Every time God showed up. They built an altar. They built something to memorialize it or to remind them what God did. Now, there are instances where the Lord instructed them to do that. But here on the Mount of Transfiguration, Yeshua is trying to let them know, hey, we're in a new season. This is a new day. Okay. The Lord Yeshua did not come to validate the priests and the Pharisees. He came to to put them on blast. He came to tear, turn over the tables in the temples to disrupt their order of service. He came to uh, be bad for business. He came to interrupt the way they were handling business in the house of God. He came to break up that den of thieves in the house of prayer. And ultimately he came to tear down the physical temple. Why? Because he would put his spirit in temples not made by hands. During the first temple, we're going to talk about the temple, the first and second temple, okay? All right, uh, we're going to go into some history because you need to understand that uh, Israel has, and not only Israel, but we, people of God, saints of God, the body of Christ, have grown dependent, have grown codependent upon a building. That's the only way that we know that we can have church. That's the only way that we know that we've been taught that God meets us and he will show up and do whatever we need him to do. I am not coming against the church. I'm a church boy. I grew, I was born and raised in church all of my entire life. So I'm not against church. I love church. But I'm here to tell you that this is a new day. God is doing a new thing. And he has sent me to tell you 
that all of these churches that are being erected and are going up, all these churches that are opening, doors that are opening, pastors that are now being installed, God hadn't sent most of them. And God has not ordained a lot of them. God is not in some of them. All right. Why? Why am I here? I'm not here to throw stones at you. I'm here to give you the word of God, pure and unadulterated, and let you see what he is trying to do with the body of Christ, where he is taking the body. The first temple period, 1200 to 586 B.C. That's the first temple period. You see, we need to understand, we need to understand that the first temple was built in 1000 B.C., by King Solomon after his father, King David, had conquered Yerushalayim and made it his capital. All right. Now, that temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. That's when uh, Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews in exile back to Babylon. OK, where they remained in captive or captivity for a time. And during that time, you know, you had the prophets Jeremiah, the prophet Ezekiel and Daniel, and they were on the scene during that time of Babylonian captivity. All right. Now, the beginning of the second temple period starts in 586, from 586 BC to AD 70. All right. This marks the return of the Jews to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity uh, in 538 BC. Okay. Now, they were allowed to return back to Yerushalayim by an edict. From Cyrus the king of Babylon. He allowed them to go back to their homeland to rebuild Yerushalayim and to rebuild the temple. All right. By 515, the reinstated Jews had completed building the second temple. All right. They got everything set up. All right. So the, now they're back in business. Okay. Now, the time of the second temple is divided into different periods. We got to understand. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first period is from 586 B.C. to 332 B.C. And then the Hellenistic period or the Greek period spans from 332 B.C. to 63 B.C. All right. Then you have the Roman period that spans from 63 B.C. to A.D. 324. All right. Now, you got to understand that it was in A.D. 70 that Yerushalayim and the temple was destroyed. It was destroyed approximately 40 years after Yeshua the Messiah said these words. In Yochanan 2, 19 and 21, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it. I will raise it up in three days. The Jews told him, he said, well, what are you talking about? It took us 46 years to build this temple. They didn't understand. He spoke of the body of his temple or his temple, which was the body. Okay. Matthew 24 verses 1 and 2 said, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple, the marvelous structure of worship. Jesus said to them, see you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, this place is going down. Matter of fact, it's not just this temple, the temple period, churches, temple, physical edifices. God ain't there. God is not going to dwell there because God is going to be dwelling in the new temple, the temple not made by human hands. You. Acts 7, 47 through 40, 49. Stephen, he addressed the Sanhedrin. Deacon Stephen, bold, full of the Holy Ghost. He said, but it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What? kind of house will you build for me, said the Lord, or where will my place of repose be? And it was at that point, the Sanhedrin had poor Stephen stoned to death because he rose up against the temple. A lot of y'all 
You've built your whole entire lives on physical church. Your whole life exists because of the physical temple. You've built your whole entire ministry, your whole entire business, your whole entire lifestyle built around and on the back of church, physical edifice. I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying that you're wrong. You're only doing what you were taught by your predecessors. But I'm here to tell you what the Lord is saying. The Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Okay. What is the reason why Yeshua was so upset with the Pharisees, with the leaders of the temple? Why was he always gunning after them? Why was he always coming for them? He called them hypocrites. He called them fools. He called them blind guides. He called them snakes, generations and broods of vipers. That's what he called the priests, the leaders. And in today's term, it would be our present day apostles, present day pastors, bishops, overseers, overlords, massa passes. I'm going to read what the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, said to the leaders of the temple. Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read the entire chapter. For those of you who can't stomach reading, then you know what? Grant and bear it. Because this scripture is going to be read today. And I urge you to please go back and do your own reading and research. Okay? Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 23. It says, Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his taught ones, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. Therefore... Whatsoever they say to you to guard, guard and do, but do not do according to their works for they say and do not do for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But with their finger, they do not wish to move them. Making slaves out of the people you call them servants and they do all their works to be seen by men. They do all their works to be seen by men. They do all their works to be seen by men. Why in the world, every time I turn around, I'm seeing on I'm seeing some of y'all, you know, leaders who I think should know better. You're always flossing. Yeah, I'm gonna use that term. That's an urban term. Why? You're flossing. On social media, every time I turn around, you want a flyer for this, a flyer for that, a flyer for this, a flyer for that. You got people taking pictures of you with your hands up in the air, worshiping, crying, on the, on the altar, snotting and crying. You got pictures all over the internet with you praying for somebody. Who you, who you want to see that? Who is that for? Who's getting glory? You or God? Yes. It's tight, but it is right. Because churchianity has taught you that that's okay. It's not okay. All right, let me keep going. Oh yeah, you too, prophet. All of y'all. Yes, the Lord is speaking to us all. All right. Let me keep going. And they do all their works to be seen by men and they make their teflon wide and the length of their seat seat or their... Uh, uh, hems of their garments broad, okay? And they love the best places at the feast and the best seats in the congregation. Always got to sit up front. Why? Why? The best seats in the house because you're special. Because you're the apostle. Because you're the bishop. Because you are the prophet. Best seats in the house. Okay, yeah, I know what churchianity has taught us, what we're used to. But come on, man. All right. And the greetings in the marketplaces to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, pastor, apostle, bishop, elder, prophet, 
minister. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Messiah, and all are brothers. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. All of you who got fathers and mothers in ministry, you need to sit down. Somebody need to instruct you what the scripture is saying because the Bible says and Yahshua himself says the son of God told us don't call nobody father. And if we're not supposed to call a man father, then we're not supposed to call a woman mother. You have one father, one heavenly father, mother, and that is Yahweh. You have been taught to become codependent on human flesh. To make people feel special and to give people power over your life. Power that God did not mean for them to have over you. And now you're servants and you're slaves on a plantation called church. But it's okay because we got scripture to back up what we're doing, right? Misquoting, twisting scripture. Go back to the Bible. Go back to the original meaning. Go back to the original text and exegete, not eisegete, exegete the scriptures. All right. Neither be called leaders, for one is your leader, the Messiah. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you shut up the reins of the heavens before men, for you do not go in, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you eat up the widow's houses and for a show make long prayers. Because of this, you shall receive greater judgment. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you go about the land and the sea to win one convert. And when he is won, you make him a son of Gehenna or a son of hell twofold more than yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides who say, Whoever swells by the dwelling place, it doesn't matter. But whoever swells by the gold of the dwelling place is bound by oath. Now you're treasuring money and wealth over the actual edifice, over the actual physical structure. Now you're treasuring and you're valuing wealth over the house of God. Mm, all right. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the dwelling place that sets apart the gold? And whoever swears, by the, whoever swears by the slaughter place, it does not matter. But whoever swears by the gift that is on uh, that place, it is, they're bound by oath. Now, the Bible says, fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the slaughter place that sets the gift apart. We treasure gifts more than we do the altar. We're treasuring gifts. Hmm. He then who swears by the slaughter place swears by it and by all that is upon it. And who who swears by the dwelling place swears by it and by whom is dwelling in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of Elohim and by him who is sitting upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you tithe the mint and the anise and the coming and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah. The right ruling, the compassion and the belief or the faith. These need to have been done without neglecting the other. You are focused on and you zoom in on and target and you lift up and proclaim the tithe, but you are still unjust in your dealings with people. You keep talking about pay tithe, pay your tithes and offering, pay your tithes and offering, tithe, tithe, tithe. Oh, your tithe ain't worth much when you're still mistreating God's people. Your tithe ain't really doing the hill of beans if you're not doing by the people what God has done to you. There are more important things in the law than the tithe. I'm not disregarding tithe. I'm not speaking against tithing and offerings, but if the Lord is tearing down temples and he's raising up temples in us to put his spirit in, 
then where are the Levites? Where is the Levitical priesthood? Who are the Levites? There ain't no Levitical priesthood today. We, individual ecclesia, we are now priests. We are now priests unto God. So, if the church, the local church, is considered the temple, and the pastor is now the Levitical priest, you're bringing your tithe to the priest, or tithing to God, right? Your 10%, 15% if you late, and your offerings. Is that really what the Lord was saying? Is that really what's supposed to be going on today? I got a whole, trust me, you ain't ready. And a lot of you pastors, you built your whole life on tithes and offerings. You're not ready for what I got to say. For what the Lord is showing us concerning the tithes, concerning the Levitical priesthood, concerning the temple. Yeshua came to throw down the temple, to build you up, temple, to build you up church to build you up ecclesia to put his spirit inside you you go and research the teachings of yahshua concerning money nowhere in the bible nowhere did he teach concerning giving 10 percent of your earnings he did not put a percentage on giving he said give out of the abundance of your heart that could be 25 percent. that could be 50 percent the widow, she had two mites, less than a penny a piece. The Pharisee, he had a whole bag of money. He gave all that he had. She gave her only two mites that she had. Who gave more? The widow, because she gave all that she had. Was there a percentage? No. All right, that's a whole nother teaching, but you ain't ready for what I got. And I know you're going to try to rebut this to save your church. I know you're going, to, you're going to try to rebut this to save your teachings that you taught erroneously in the past concerning tithes and offering. I know you're going to try to rebut it. I know you're going to try to save face. You're going to try to dismiss what I said. You're going to try to, uh, you know, say that, hey, he's doing some false teaching. He don't know what he's talking about. But have you read the law? Have you actually read the law, studied the law? Have you actually handwritten the law word for word? If you have not, then there is nothing you can say to me concerning this. Because you need to understand that the Lord is bringing you to a place where light is being shown on churchianity and the dealings of churchianity in its era. He's bringing order back to the kingdom. Order. Real order. Right order. Let me finish reading. Let me finish reading. I'm ready for you. Come for me come. Mm. All right. The Bible reads, blind guides, verse 24, straining at, out at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside of them becomes clean too. You're whitewashed. Everybody think everything is okay with you. You're making everybody think that you are okay. You're making everybody think that you're all holy and righteous. You're making everybody think that you got it, you got it going on with God, that you're God's favorite. But inside you're dirty. Inside you're clean. You're bitter. You're, you're filthy. You're harboring uncleanness, iniquity in your heart, unforgiveness. Ah. The Bible reads, verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! But you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly indeed look well, but inside are filled with dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly indeed appear righteous to men, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have partaken with them in the blood of the prophets. Thus you bear witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who did murder the prophets. And you fill up the measure of your fathers. Serpents! Brood of adders! How would you escape the judgment of hell? 
Because of this, see, I send you prophets and wise men and scholars of scripture. Some of them you shall kill and impale, and some of them you shall flog in your congregations and persecute from city to city. You're doing that. Why are you killing your prophets that God sent you? God sent you scholars of the scripture. He sent you prophets and holy men. He sent you sick ones, but because they are not saying things that you think you need to hear, they're saying things that are contrary to what you believe or what you've been taught your whole life. You are flogging them, whipping them in your congregations. Yeshua is pointing you out. Yeshua is pointing you out. Uh, so that on you should come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of the righteous Hebel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechah, whom you murdered between the dwelling place and the slaughter place. Truly I say to you, all this shall come upon this generation. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, killing the prophets and stoning those sent to her. Killing the prophets and stoning those that are sent to her. Killing and stoning the sent ones. Because you don't understand them. Because they are speaking things that are contrary to what you have learned in all of your time in churchianity. All of those erroneous teachings by your predecessors. All of those things that you were raised to believe concerning denominationalism, concerning theology, concerning all the things dealing with ecclesiastical teachings. You have been taught some things that are not right. And God is saying, I have sent you people, holy, sent ones, scholars of the scriptures, prophets, and you're killing them. You're stoning them. You're whipping them right in your congregations. And God is not pleased. How often I wish to gather your children together the way a hen gathered her chickens under her wings. But you wouldn't have it. God is trying to reconcile. He's trying to bring his people together. He's trying to gather and heal and restore. But you ain't trying to have it. You want it your way. See, your house is left to you laid waste. For I say to you, from now on, you shall by no means see me until you say, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. All right, I have read Matthew chapter 23 in its entirety to bring some understanding and some clarity about why Yahshua the Messiah felt the way he felt about the temple. And why he went in there in a rage, whipping everybody out with a whip of cords and throwing over tables. Why he said, see you not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Why was he bent on destroying the temple? Why was the son of God bent on throwing down the physical edifice? Discontinuing the operation of the physical edifice. Why? So then where do we gather? What do we assemble? What is the church? What the Romans taught you? Huh? What Catholicism taught you? No, 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 no. No. We need to understand that when the Bible speaks of kingdom, he is not talking about a physical edifice. He is not talking about a gathering of people. In the first church, in the first century, right prior to Antioch, how was the word of God being preached? What was happening? How was the proselytizing of uh, the new faith in Yeshua being spread? How was the gospel being taught? Where were they gathering to pray? They were going house to house, from house to house. The gospel was being preached and taught from house to house, house to house. I'm trying to prepare you for what's coming now. You're not listening. You're stubborn. You're stuck in your ways. Please open your eyes, open your heart, and listen to what the Spirit of Truth is saying. Persecution. Persecution of the church is at hand. The day is coming when you will not be able to meet in a local assembly called church. 
but you're going to have to meet like they did in the first church from house to house. I will even go on to say that there will be a day when the church will go underground because having church will be an act of lawlessness. It will be a violation in the laws of the land. I'm trying to prepare you for what's coming. You're so comfortable with your conferences. You're so comfortable with your networks. You're so comfortable with being on flyers and being plastered all over the social networks, praying and prophesying and laying hands on folk and snotting and crying on the altar and dancing around. Who's getting glory? Again, who's being glorified? Why? Who needs to see that? For what purpose? You want people to know how anointed you are? You want people to know how holy you are? You want people to know how accurate you are prophetically? Who's getting glory? Is it for you or God? Listen, this teaching is not to throw you under the bus. But this teaching is to let you see that the real kingdom is at hand. And the real kingdom has nothing to do with a physical building. All right. What is the real kingdom? Malkuta, the Aramaic word Malkuta, it means the reign of God. Malkuta Delecha or Malkuta Debesmaya means it's translated as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the dominion of God and the reign of God, God's imperial reign, the inheritance of God. Malkuta, Malkuta, Malkuta Ha Elohim, the kingdom of God. Is at hand. Now, what is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is not food or drink. We can see this in the scriptures. The Bible says in Colossians 4 and 11 and Romans 14 and 17 the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Let's look at righteousness. The Aramaic word for righteousness is zadika. Hebrew is tzedek. It means righteous. It means it's meat. It means it is fit. It means it is proper. It is right. We must be in line with Zadika. Zadika, fit, meet, proper, rightly aligned. That's what God is calling us to, to be rightly aligned, to be fit, to be meat for the master's use, to be proper. Peace, the Aramaic word for peace is Shalama, Hebrew Shalom. What is that? It means peace. It means completeness. It means wholeness. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. That's what God has called us to. A life of shalom or shalama. Shalama. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Wholeness, completeness, fullness. Joy. The Aramaic word for joy is chaduta. Chaduta. It means joy, happiness, to rejoice, to be glad, delightful. And that's what God has called us to, a life of joy, a life of, 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 of happiness, a life of being rejoiceful, a life of being happy and delighting in his word, delighting in his word, in his presence. So the kingdom of God is Zadika, Shalama, and Kaduta in Ruach HaKodesh. The Aramaic word for the Holy Spirit is Rucha Kodasha. All right? Rucha Kocha. Rucha Kocha. And that is Ruach HaKodesh. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. It is the sacred spirit, the essence of Yahweh, the wind of Yahweh, the breath of Yahweh, the fire of Yahweh, the water of Yahweh, the life, the zoe of Yahweh. All right. 
So let's go back to the Mount of Transfiguration. All right, let's go to the scripture that we started at. Okay, the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. The disciples, after seeing Yeshua the Messiah in his illumined, glorified state, talking with Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the first thing they wanted to do after experiencing the move of God, after experiencing the glory of God, they wanted to build a church, over which I assume they would probably be the pastors. But Peter said, Lord, if you will, please let us build a temple for you. Let us build a tabernacle for Moses and let us build a church for Elijah. Did the Messiah allow it? No. Why did the Messiah come? To get rid of the physical temple and its operation because they were foul in their dealings. The Pharisees were taking advantage of the people. The Sanhedrin, the scribes, they were taking advantage of God's people, milking them for their money. They were unjustly dealing with them. They were turning, in, turning them into ser servants and slaves in the name of God. Yeshua the Messiah came. His death, burial, and resurrection made it possible for you to become a joint heir with him, his body, you individually, all individual people who accept the Lord Yeshua the Messiah as the son of Yahweh and let him rule in their heart. Those who are transformed, those who have confessed their sins and received him in their heart. You are the temple of Yahweh. The kingdom of Yahweh is within you. Luke 17, and I'm going to go ahead and end this with this scripture. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them saying, who? Who answered? Yeshua the Messiah, the son of God. He answered, he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's not going to come because you're looking for it real hard. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You want to know why the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin were so inflamed against the Messiah, Yeshua? You want to know why they sought to kill him? Why they sought to wipe him out? Why they sought to end his ministry and his life? Because he challenged the temple. He threatened the life of the church. He threatened to tear down the church. He put them to an open shame and called them what they really were. Blind guides. Vipers. Fools. Snakes. Hypocrites. That's why they wanted to kill him. That's why they, that's why they did what they did. And God allowed it. He allowed it. He said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So I say to the Lord Yahshua, the Messiah, after having spoken this message today, Lord, whatever cup shall come to my lips, I know it will be bitter and it has been bitter. And I know it will continue to be bitter. Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you shalom.